Welcome back to our last video in our sequence on optimization for machine learning and in particular about constraint problems that we have been discussing for, for quite some time now. And well, I've prepared a little bit here. This is our optimality condition, which I'm going to fill out in a second. And this is the problem that we ended up with last time where we had our original constraint optimization problem that we replaced by a local quadratic approximation of the loss function as well as a local linear approximation of the constraints. And what we did in the second step, this gave us our QP and our QP hat now is the version where we have replaced the inequality constraints, so the first part here, by the active components of these which give us then a set with equality constraints. And this is what the active set refers to in the name. Um, and now the question is how do we solve it in an efficient manner, the, the QP hat, which in the end will allow us to then give us a solution to the QP and we sequentially solve this multiple times to in the end arrive at the optimum of our constraint arbitrarily shaped nonlinear optimization problem. Right? I'm not going to talk about convergence results here, but you know, under certain conditions one can really prove that this rigorously that we will find an optimizer, a local minimizer for the original problem. All right, so where did we end uh, last video? We talked about the optimality conditions, the KKT conditions, and we saw that these were in fact linear. And what I wrote is where these three lines, where we had the, the KKT condition, which means gradients of loss function plus KKT multiplier times gradients of equality and inequality constraints, or in our case, multipliers times gradients of the active components of the inequality constraints plus multiplier times the equality constraints. And so this was our first line. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to write this as a matrix vector product here. So what I have is my update for my weight, the S, so WK plus one minus WK, the, the, the way in which I'm going to update my weights. And then I have the multiplier. This was the lambda multiplier in front of the active components of my inequality constraints. And I have a second multiplier mu for the true equality constraints. You know, I could combine these into one variable because in fact I do only have equality constraints, but we will see during well, the derivation of the active set algorithm that this distinction is quite important. Right? Because if you recall, in the KKT conditions, we had no further conditions on the multipliers associated with the equality constraints, but we had this non-negativity constraint on the multipliers for the inequality constraints. And so this is the distinction that is really important. And so what we had then was our condition, the gradient of the loss function was, you know, there was this quadratic term H times S, um, which uh, was very, very important. And then we had the derivative of the linear term, which was G times S, which gave us G as the derivative. And so G has no influence on S, lambda, and mu, the, the term itself. So we are going to write it to the left-hand side. So this is derivative of the quadratic term, H times S, derivative of the linear term, the constant term, the derivative is zero. And then we had the derivative of our constraints, right, which was the, the coefficient matrix times the lambda. So what I have here is the C, the active set, right? This is the C matrix here, times lambda, plus the C hat matrix times mu. And so you see this is really our KKT condition for optimality just written in another way. And so here are two blocks remaining, which, and I said this uh, also uh, last time, um, this is a, a condition that has to be satisfied, but it does not on its own guarantee that the constraints are truly satisfied. And for this, we had the, the situation that we actually need to write this out. So C transpose times S has to be equal or plus DA, which gives us a minus DA here, has to be zero. So there were no lambdas or mu's in the equation. And the same has to hold for the other ones, so C hat transpose S plus D hat, so here is minus D hat, has to be also zero. And so again, no components 
for either of those. And so you see, let's denote this by a star because this is an equation that we're going to need uh, a couple of times now. We see actually that this is a linear system and we know well it can be easily solved by, well, explicitly by computing the inverse, which is not advisable numerically, but instead what you can do is um, you can solve this using, you know, very efficient solvers for linear systems and we're not going to bother with the details here. So what we can say now is that this is really um, the setting that we had, but we want to do this in an iterative fashion. So what I'm going to do now is I'm, I'm relabeling this one just for, for clarity. So our s is really our s in the kth iteration and the multipliers are the multipliers in the next iteration. You know, you may say this looks weird because we have the s in the kth iteration and the other ones in the k plus first iteration. So solving this gives me updated values of the multipliers. But if you think about this, this one really just means that I can compute the update for the weights by adding this sk to my previous weight. Okay, so you see solving the system gives me an updated version of weights lambdas and mu's. And so this one can be solved in closed form and then we have an update. Why do we need an update? And so this iterate here is not the same as the iterate, let's say, in for our nonlinear problem. These are iteration numbers for the active set algorithm to solve this one. And so here's the question, why do we need iteration numbers if I just said we can solve it in closed form solution? Sounds like you solve it once and we're happy. But here's the problem, the active set is what makes this thing challenging, right? Because this can obviously change. I do not know in advance what the active set is going to be in the end. So what I need to do is I need to solve this problem and then I need some sort of check whether the solution really satisfies my constraint set in the end. And so if this is the case, I can go home happily. If this is not the case, then I need to reiterate my active set and make updates for well, let's say the, the A and then resolve this problem again. So here's what this active set algorithm consists of. We start with an initial guess. Now what I'm saying is I'm going to select a feasible W0. which means that the W0 is inside a set W, okay? Until now we have always said the optimization variable is going to be inside just the, the real numbers, Q of them. And what I'm going to say here is it's inside a feasible set, which is, well, let's not be too detailed here maybe, but this just means that the constraints, excuse me, that the constraints are satisfied. Okay, so I need to pick an initial guess which does not violate my constraints. And what I can do now is, if I have done so, it is rather easy to just identify the active set. Why? Because I can just evaluate the C, the constraint function, um, the, the inequality constraint function and check which of the constraints are met with equality, which of these are met with strict inequality. And so the active set is only the subset that is really active. And what I get by this is the columns of my A matrix, or my C matrix, excuse me, that really relate to these active columns and so to these active constraints and the same for the D matrix. So we had this before, we had C and D which is a sum of the gradients of the constraints plus the, the, the constraint evaluations themselves and here we are doing a sort of sub sampling in terms of the active components and once we have done this and here you see there's this problem right, this can change obviously. For this W I have an active set. If I update the W, the active set does not have to stay the same. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to introduce this iteration variable that I 
used here already. So k is one, two, and so on, as far as I need it. And so what I need to do is I can simply solve this optimization problem. Okay, so what I'm going to do is for each of these, what I'm going to do is I'm solving the problem that I've labeled with the star here. And what I get is I get my SK and my lambda k plus one and my mu k plus one. I just noticed this has to start at zero, obviously. Otherwise it doesn't make sense. So we start at k zero, go to one and so on. So given initial guess, we compute the update for, for, for s for in order to get the next uh, w and we calculate these multipliers. And now we have a case sensitive situation, let's say, and I'm trying to plot this in a, in a sort of a diagram. So what I'm going to check now is if this sk is zero or not, right? And so here's one situation, let's say it is actually zero. What does this mean? It really means that I have no update for my W. So the optimal solution for this system uh, does not give me an update for, for the weights, which means I'm basically done. However, there's this question. Remember I said that there's an additional condition on this lambda that we need to check. So here's the question is the lambda, the K plus one, the lambda greater or equal than zero for all indices i. Okay, so what this means is after I've solved this to or found this to be zero, are the lambdas really non-negative? Remember, if I have a negative lambda, then the KKT conditions do not hold. There was this condition that the lambdas have to be non-negative. So if this one is also answered with yes, then we are happy. Right? This means, okay, the KKT conditions are satisfied, no further update, we're done. And what we do is we set our W star, our optimal solution, to WK. Okay. We don't care about the K plus one because S is zero, so these are identical anyways. Okay, but now there's some sections still left, so what happens if this one has to be answered with no? Then we see, uh -huh, we do have an optimal solution, but not for the original problem, right? Because the KKT conditions are not satisfied. So what we need to consider is that apparently the constraint that we set as active is not really necessary or required to be active. So what we need to do is we need to make changes to the active set. And how we're doing this, doing this is by removing an index i from a for which the corresponding multiplier is smallest. Right, and I'm not going into details here, but what can be found or what one can argue is that this is an indicator that this particular you know, change in the active set will as allow, allow us to maximally reduce the loss function. So it's a strategy to you know, activate or allow for a direction which is a lot, uh, has potential for a lot of improvement. All right, so here we are and if we do this, we need to go back to the loop and solve the problem again. Obviously, right? Because uh, let me denote this like this. Then you need to go back and resolve the problem. Right? And this is why I said we have these iteration numbers because solving a linear system in its own is not necessarily sufficient if the solution does not satisfy the KKT conditions. Okay, so this is the case where we are happy that we have found an optimal solution. What? if we have not found an optimal solution in the first one, which means we do have an actual update. 
And so now there's two things that really can happen. And what I need to check is what happens with the updated value for my weights. So the question is, is the updated weight value still in my feasible set? Remember, this is what I introduced here. Why is this so important? We have linearized our constraints. Okay, so what really happens is, let's assume we have a constraint that looks like this. Okay, and so let's assume this is the reason that is not allowed, right? So inside this or below this curve, we are allowed to remain outside would be a violation of our constraint. So here we have C of W smaller zero, and here it's equal to zero along this line. And so a linearization around some point means that the constraint really is approximated by such a line, all right? And so you see if I'm now taking a step here, which takes me here, then you see the constraint may be violated for the, or may be acceptable for the linearized constraint, but it may violate the original constraint. So what happens is that I need to check whether my update satisfies the constraints of the original problem. And again, I have two cases that I need to consider. One is the case yes, which again is the case that makes us very happy because we can simply use the update, okay? So what this means is I'm taking my wk plus one just as wk plus sk. And again, I take this output and go back to solving the problem again, right? And so here, you know, I have found an update and this gives me a, a good solution and I can repeat, repeat until I have no further decrease here. And here, this is now the most problematic case, let's say. So I have found a suitable direction in which I can reduce my, or the update will reduce my loss function value, but the constraint is not satisfied. And what you can do now is you can simply try to find a reduced step in this direction so that the constraint is actually satisfied. Remember our video on Armeo backtracking, where we said, okay, you start with a large step size and then you sequentially reduce the step length until you have a situation where the step is feasible. This is the same thing that we're going to do here. So what we're going to say is backtracking. Such that WK plus one, which is now not computed according to this rule, but WK plus our step size theta SK until this one is an element of our feasible set again, okay? And so now you see we have a rule that gives us a feasible step and again, we are going to use this and repeat. And so this concludes our algorithm here where you see the active set strategy is really very, very nice because it looks rather complicated, but in fact, it's not so much because we're solving a linear system and then we just have these four cases. We check whether the update is zero or not. If it's zero, then we're happy if the constraints are satisfied. We change the active set if the constraints are violated. And if we do have an actual update, then we either accept it or we accept it once we have found a suitable smaller step in this direction. And this overall gives us a very efficient algorithm. And if we do this until convergence, we will find a solution not to the QP hat, but to the quadratic program for which we have equality and inequality constraints. You know, this active set strategy finds a solution to QP where the active set in the end is the, the correct set. And then we go back to our SQP solver and find a new quadratic approximation and repeat this entire procedure once more. So it does sound tedious, but it does help us to, to solve, you know, really complicated constraint problems in a straightforward manner because all it boils down to in the end is finding quadratic approximations and solving linear systems. 
And this concludes our, concludes our lecture series on optimization for machine learning. I hope that you have now a good intuition about you know, optimality conditions, gradient descent, learning rates, a bit about stochastic gradient descent, and also about constraints. So this, you know, there's a lot more to explore in the area of optimization, but I guess this kind of sets the basics for, for machine learning that are really important and from where you can look for further details if necessary. So thanks for watching and see you in the next videos.